Well, God gave me some homework, as he usually does every couple, three days. My niece called me up and said she was reading a verse in the Bible in James 4.10. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. What's the problem with that one verse? She hadn't read the first nine verses before that, and I hadn't studied it. I hadn't studied it in detail. James is speaking to believers. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have. So <clears throat> you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain. So you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses, do you not know, we're speaking to believers, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy to, of God. Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? <clears throat> he jealously, he, God, jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. He hasn't made it, he's enabled it brought it to dwell in us, but he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, the word says, God is opposed to the proud, <coughs> but gives grace to the humble. <coughs> There's that word humble. So he commands believers, not unbelievers, believers. Therefore, submit, therefore, to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The question as to how do you do that, I could throw stuff up there, but I haven't investigated this thoroughly yet. Then he says in verse 8, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Then the verse, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. So this sounds like a lot of obedience and that paying attention to scripture. Uh, I don't want to start guesstimating, so I like to do a thorough study. <laughs> question question is, it's a matter of time. How do I answer her question uh, within a certain time frame? Because this might take me a long time to go through these ten verses. James is not an easy book to read. Just so I know that it's addressed to Christians and how they're behaving. So I like, I like to look around and see if I've addressed the word humble someplace else, and I did. Philippians. Um, Philippians chapter 2, I believe. Let's take a look at that. And I think I investigated it sufficiently Yes, I did it sufficiently to examine the meaning of humble, and which kind of would corroborate what James is saying. So the best I can do at this point in the moment, as I would look into James chapter 4, the answer up to 10, is to see what I've already done, if it's done thoroughly enough to answer the point. So, Let's take a look at Bible study manuals. Philippians chapter 2. I looked into the, especially uh, the part where Jesus emptied himself and became man. So we can start at the top. <clears throat> I can surmise a little bit. I didn't do anything with 1 and 2. Philippians 2, 1 to 2. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy, Paul says, by being like-minded, having the same love, the agape love, being of one accord with one mind. Let's just take a little look at a, at a, a, a commentary that I use. I go through it carefully. 
Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. Take a look at the commentary. We just read 1 and 2. Let's take a look. Maybe the shorter Bible knowledge commentary. 2 1. You get a, a handle on this. This is what I usually do. Think about it. See what somebody else has to say about that. Is this, this commentary is Bible knowledge commentary and expositors Bible commentary have been fairly, fairly uh, helpful in providing some points of view that I can then validate by going back and checking the passage myself. So we looked at the versions. Therefore, if any is any of if therefore if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being the, of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in the Spirit, intent on one purpose. So let's see what it has to say in the commentary, Bible knowledge commentary. Paul had written about living the Christian life in harmony with the message on which it is based. Okay. He followed that message with a call to show forth spiritual unity. This unity is possible because of the reality of the four qualities mentioned in 2.1. The if clauses, being translations of first-class conditions in Greek, speak of certainties, since, meaning since. So, if this passage, if, may be translated since, Paul wrote here about realities, not questionable things. Paul appealed on the basis of encouragement from being united in Christ. Yes, when I find a believer, I figure we're both of one accord that we're united together with Christ in position, not necessarily in a harmonious relationship or a knowledgeable relationship. Comfort from his love, his agape love, his self-sacrifice for our sins. Fellowship with the Spirit, because we have the, the Spirit within us. Tenderness and compassion. So he's speaking basically to the church at Philippi and as an example, as they led their lives evidently fairly uh, harmoniously, we're to do the same. So encouragement is from the Greek word related to one Christ used in referring to the Holy Spirit as the counselor, comforter. It may be also translated exhortation in the sense of either rebuke or comfort. Since each believer has received this work of the Spirit within them, Paul used it as a basis to appeal for their spiritual unity. Also, they each had comfort from his God's love. God's love in people's hearts produces spiritual unity in their lives. Fellowship with the Spirit as a, is as a result of the Spirit's permanent indwelling ministry. And this may refer, however, to fellowship that comes from the Holy Spirit, just as encouragement comes from Christ and comfort comes from love. So Paul also spoke of tenderness and compassion. One of the Spirit's ministries is to produce within each believer a concern and love for other members of God's family. This may be received or rejected by a believer, but the Spirit's work is a reality and is a basis for spiritual unity. I kind of like some of the stuff in there. See if you like it. And uh, we gave you, uh, it gives you some corroborative passages. Get that out of the way here. This is a great resource. I just put my little finger on there. And, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? So that's the indwelling ministry. Tenderness. Philemon. For I have come to have much joy and comfort in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. So a good believer who's concerned agape love for the fellow brethren in Christ shows uh, an encouragement, a tremendous encouragement to one another. Okay, so let's go back to verse 3, Philippians 2.3. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. That's pretty plain and clear. But in lowliness of mind, ladies esteem others better than themselves. Wow, that seems like direct to the point about humble yourselves, which is, as we look further on down in this passage in Philippians chapter 2, that's what it says. So we're getting some great instructions that fulfill what James said. Take a look at James. Remind yourself, James says, 4.10 What did he say in 4.10? Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. 
this kind of goes hand in hand with this. Being obedient, love one another, fellowship with one another. That's kind of like, and think of others better than yourself. I love that. All the way back to let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in loneliness of mind. Is that humility? Let each esteem others as better than himself. Whether you think you're better than somebody else or not, actually, esteem others as better than yourself. That's agape, self-sacrificial, put the other one first before you, love. Okay, now we get to Philippians 2.4. Let each one of you, let each of you look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Well, that goes hand in hand with the previous verse. Think of others as better than yourself. Agape is self Nothing out of selfish ambition, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you not only have for his own, not only look out for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. Now here comes the five to six A, which I really addressed in detail because I was um, using these verses, viewing these verses because of the controversy and uh, whether or not Jesus Christ is actually God. So. The Greek phrase rendered who being existed, subsisted in the form of God refers to the continual existence of Christ Jesus as God, almighty, eternal, immutable, and holy, an eternal existence that cannot cease or die for the sins of mankind as some contend or change in any way since God is immutable. That's the key topical heading. Why are we going to this? Because it's what Jesus did. The Son of God sets apart, sets aside, not apart, sets aside his expression as God. He's in the form of God. Well, if you're God, you have the form of God absolutely, perfectly, and unchangeably, and eternally, almighty, and holy. And he set himself, how, how much humility can you have by you set yourself, set aside your expression as God, to become man and express only within your humanity toward others. Wow. So, that's what it says. Let, it, let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, who, although he existed, subsisted, in the form of God, did not regard, regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Some people say, well, he didn't be, cease to become God again. But God is immutable, unchangeable, eternal, almighty. How can you undo that? And then in verse 6, uh, in the King James Version, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself, verse 7, of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Talk about humbling himself but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of man. Two different versions there. Very close. And New King James Version, verse 8. And being found in appearance as a man. Uh, what is that humble, humble humility? Found in appearance. Let's see what that actually means. He humbled himself. Oh, there's the humble. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Not only did he set aside his expression as almighty God, unchangeable, right? Uncreated, perfect being. But then he appears in the form of man in some way. Actually, I would say uh, uh, became man because it says so in John chapter 1, verse 14. He became man, added to, to himself perfect humanity, and then allowed himself to physically die on the cross. God over here, humbles himself all the way down. How far can you go? Dies on the cross for you and I. Notice he did it out of your need. Set his own needs aside to tend to your need and died on the cross for you. I mean, this is a peculiar constructed Greek verse, Philippians 2.6, who in form, morphe, of God subsisted, not robbery esteemed it, the, to be equal with God. And there, there's a ways of translating this thing that reflect what the words actually say and the ways you can twist it 
And if you're not careful,